altruism. Tonight, we're honoured to have as our guest speaker His Excellency Noel White, Australian, uh, the Irish Ambassador to Australia, jointly accredited to, Austra to Fiji, New Zealand, Solomon Islands, and Papua New Guinea. But he does spend most of his time, I'm, I'm sure, here in Australia. Uh, Noel read law at Trinity College Dublin before going to the bar and then entered the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs in 1985. Tonight, he speaks to us about modern Ireland, the 40th anniversary of its accession to the then European Economic Community, which also coincides with Ireland assuming the presidency for the seventh time of the EU. He will talk about the European Economic Crisis, which affected Ireland as a seriously, or even more so, perhaps than it did any other EU member, and about Irish plans during the remainder of its tenure as President of the Union. Noel, welcome here, and let me just add that, in my view as a Republican, I'm a bit of an Elizabethan, but not a monarchist, and I'm certainly a Republican. Uh, I, I keep advising my colleagues and friends that we have a solution, and the solution is for the President, somewhat like the Irish do. It would be wonderful if we could bring our minds around to doing that. Anyway, thank you so much for being here. And to you, sir. Thank you very much. Forgive me if I haven't got a script on that particular subject. Excuse me. Thank you very much for the warm welcome to you and to the members of the Institute. It's very, very kind of you. Welcome to this great opportunity to be here and so on. I'm pleased to have it. Um, I think the work that's undertaken here at the Institute provides an important platform uh, for balanced uh, and informed discussion. So I'm shifting and uh, shifting a little easily because I've got this kit over here and I'm thinking if I, if I kick it the wrong way, we could go offline and that would be um, It's okay, I've got it. I've got it. Um, but sir, just uh, as I was saying, I think it prov provides an important platform uh, for balanced and informed discussion around the foreign policy issues of the day, and then these are important things, and it's important that people come out on a Tuesday night in the rain um, to have these kind of conversations. Um, and uh, I certainly uh, am grateful to you all for being here, and uh, I look forward to taking questions and uh, having a lively discussion with you as the, as the evening wears on. But I want to, in my remarks generally, the, the title, as you know, of the, of the of my talk this evening, Ireland, a time of presidency, um, which really, uh, in the true spirit of, of the Department of Foreign Affairs, covers a multitude, um, and allows me to speak about anything I bloody want. Um, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I will try and uh, contain some of the thoughts and ideas uh, that I want to convey to you this evening. I want to look at Ireland today. Uh, where it is, where it's been, where it's going, but to interweave that with uh, its place in Europe, the presidency which it was just completed uh, of the Council of Member States of, uh, of the European Union, uh, and through the lens of Ireland to see where your perspectives are for Europe, and indeed what perspectives are indeed for Ireland itself, and the perspectives of Europe. Uh, so I've, I'll try and interweave it as much as I can. I'll say a bit about the presidency. Uh, some of some elements of the technicalities of the presidency, what we did, what we set out to do, where I think we have gotten to, uh, and what that says about Ireland and where Ireland and Europe are together. Um, I took up my post in, in Australia in January of last year, some, some, some 18 months ago. Um, since joining the Department of Foreign Affairs, I've worked in a number of areas, but for one reason or another, uh, a greater part of my experience has uh, featured the European Union in one form or another. So in total, at this stage, and I worked this out before I got here, um, I've worked on EU issues, uh, both in Ireland's permanent representation to the EU, R and D within the European institutions themselves, uh, for some 14 of the last 20 years, and it leaves its mark. Um, during my time in Brussels, uh, I saw significant evolution of the EU project at very close quarters. Um, it was an intense period of institutional development. It was a period during which the single market was designed and implemented, a period during which the foundations of political union were laid down, uh, a period during which a common cur currency uh, was conceived and delivered. 
a period during which the European community enlarged from 12 member states to 15, and then 25, and then to 27, and as of a few days ago, 28. And a period also during which the Euro European community transformed itself into a European Union. Not surprisingly, um, the role of the presidency has changed over that time too. Uh, since the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty, the external representation function has been largely subsumed uh, into the European External Action Service. Internally, however, the presidency has not been affected to the same extent. It is as relevant and indeed as onerous today uh, as it has ever been. Uh, there are major practical organizational and logistical implications of the presidency, and there are also major practical and logistical implications of trying to work these slides. So bear with me. It works. Um, the figures tend to impress. These are simply the formations of council, and I think we're into, we're into 10 uh, at this stage. But there are major practical organization implications, logistical implications for all of for whatever member state happens to take the presidency. The figures tend to impress. We will talk about, I think in this case, some 2,500 meetings chaired by Ireland, some 23,000 delegates participated in meetings in Ireland, 76 hours of debate, or number of debates in which the Taoiseach and ministers participated, and on and on and on it goes. But frankly, from my, from my point of view, these are the more prosaic uh, elements of the thing. Um, but all it says and done, the evaluation of the presidency uh, will hinge on substance, and uh, not happily uh, on the quality of the presidency tie the presidency scarf, for that matter, or even the user friendliness of the presidency website, but rather on what the presidency manages to get over the line. And I think it should probably come some reassurance uh, to us all uh, in the times in which we live uh, that substance, in this case policy, still matters. Um, we should all take some comfort in that. I uh, but if you look at Ireland in Europe, we say, well, the role of the presidency has changed over the period that I have described. And I guess it's fair to say that well, Ireland has changed too. Uh, 2013, the first semester, marked Ireland's seventh EU presidency, but it also marked 40 years since Ireland acceded to the then European Economic Community. Uh, those 40 years tell quite a story of transformation. From the predominantly agricultural-based economy in 1973, trading mostly in primary products, mostly into one market, that of its nearest neighbor, Great Britain, to a more sophisticated, broad-based economy exporting a range of goods, agricultural still, for sure, but also high-tech goods and services, right across the 28 member states of the Union, and indeed further afield, including here in Australia, where they also find a very receptive market. But with EU support, Ireland over that time has built a modern infrastructure, a strong educational system, it has become the magnet for foreign direct investment, attracted by the ease of doing business, by the availability of the skilled workforce, also by the access that it provides to over 5 million consumers across 28 United States, and indeed, the bridge that it uniquely provides between Europe on the one hand and the United States on the other. I think in Ireland's case as well, it's important to recall that the ideals of peace and mutual respect which underpin the EU project, provided a platform for the Union to play a very important role in the peace process in the island of Ireland, a role which it continues to maintain to this day. Uniquely, uniquely in Ireland's case, successive amendments to the EU treaties have been put to the Irish electorate in referendum. In fact, since 1972, if I'm not mistaken, we've had eight EU-related referenda to date. Despite the challenges uh, that some of these public consultations have thrown down to the political classes, core support for the European Union in Ireland has remained steady. Uh, a poll in January of this year found that 85% of Irish people believe that Ireland should remain in the EU, and 83% believe that we have profited from membership. We are clear in our view, ladies and gentlemen, that Ireland's long-term economic and political interests lie in a strong and a cohesive uh, European Union. As many of you will know, uh, in 2008, Ireland was hit by a rather serious crisis, one without a parallel. In November 2010, at the height of that crisis, known locally as the GFC, 
Ireland entered an EU IMF support program. The situation was far from pretty. In Ireland's case, in double quick time, budget surpluses turned into double digit deficits. Unemployment rose from 4% to 14%. The banking system effectively collapsed <coughs> and, all, and all at enormous cost to our citizens. The dramatic consequences for our national debt and not to mention our national mood. All of this happened before the various European mechanisms that we have now built were put in place. Two years on, two and a half years on, we dare to believe that we are on the road to recovery. The economy is expected to grow in 2013 for the third consecutive year. Exports are booming, <coughs> government spending is under control, foreign direct investment is vigorous, the fiscal position has improved, we have made progress in tackling our debt levels. But ladies and gentlemen, this new stability, this new confidence has been hard won. Well, how hard won? Well, for starters, Ireland is implementing a budgetary adjustment equivalent to about 20% of GDP over the period 2008 to 2015. This is not easy. Austerity hurts. But we believe we are on track to deliver a budget deficit below the 3% of GDP target by 2015. Market confidence is apparently returning, and we expect to exit the EU IMF program for the end of this year. The debates of the day which frame and give expression to the crisis, discussions of common currency, EMU, banking union, and so on. These debates are being played out for real in Ireland. The experience of Ireland encapsulates, for many commentators, the consequences of the euro, its strengths, its weaknesses. The response to the crisis is also uniquely encapsulated or captured in the Irish experience. The judgment on the response to the crisis, economic as well as institutional, will, for many commentators and many others, hinge on what happens in Ireland. In the light of what it has been through and is still living through, Ireland is well placed then to understand and indeed to address the pressing needs of an EU <coughs> dealing with the trauma of the Eurozone crisis. Ireland, it is fair to say, assumed the presidency at a critical moment in time. As one of the member states, most seriously affected by the financial and economic crisis, we know only too well the need to learn from the mistakes of the past, to fix what needs to be fixed, and to get confidence and growth back into the economy. A member state making the journey to recovery should be well placed to lead a union committed to the same objective. Never before, therefore, I suggest, have the priorities of the member state occupying the presidency and those of the union elided to such an extent. It is indeed, in my view, a timely presidency. And little wonder, too, that the overriding themes for Ireland's presidency were stability, jobs, and growth. Uh, as presidency, sorry, as presidency, um, Ireland prioritized, not surprisingly, the restoration of global confidence in the financial system and economic stability in the Euro area and in the EU. The EU, the Union, surprise, surprise, needs a stable basis for its work. It needs the economic governance measures to prevent future crises. A well-regulated, a well-functioning financial sector. It also needs the budget, the money, to realize its ambitions. So, as presidency, we came into the unfinished business of what is affectionately referred to as the multi-annual financial framework, also known as the MFF. Budget, <coughs> the union's budget for the period 2014 to 2020. Such is the importance of this file alone that it will become for many the reference point on which the Irish presidency will be judged. We invested significant political capital in this dossier. As presidency, we also took on the ongoing work of banking union, a package of measures designed to provide the government's architecture, um, which, had it been available at the time, could have deflected or at least diminished the impact of the crisis. Jobs, with unemployment rates in the euro area currently of the order of 11%, with over 12% and in, in, and in over 12 in the EU as a whole, it's clear that this is the most pressing issue which faces us. Quite simply, we need to focus on jobs. As presidency, therefore, we set ourselves the objective of addressing in particular 
preliminary of youth unemployment. Growth. Single market has been vital for growth and for jobs in Europe and remains one of the EU's greatest and unsung success stories. The next phase of Europe's recovery will involve untapping its full potential uh, to reflect the way we live today thanks to technology and what's now become, become known as the digital single market. Digital agenda is driving competitiveness in Europe and is the source for jobs in the future. These were the three broad areas which we addressed. For the purposes of analysis, for the purpose of describing what it is we set out to achieve, they can be treated as separate and distinct headings. In reality, of course, the overlap between them is evident. But for our purposes, too, of assessing what has been achieved, they provide useful pointers. So how do we do? In terms of stability, let's look first at the whole area of economic affairs, economic and monetary affairs. Important results were recorded in the drive to stabilize European economies and to design a safer, stronger, uh, uh, and a better regulated banking sector. And it's not too much and that do. Um, banking union on the one side, economic governance on the other. Um, on banking union, significantly, uh, we reached agreement uh, on the proposals for a single supervisory mechanism, a core element of the entire package of bringing stability to the euro area banking system, uh, and one which, particularly in the Irish case, is central to breaking the link between banking debt and sovereign debt. We also push forward in the European semester. This is the package of measures which deals with the, which, which provides a process for economic and budgetary coordination between member states and promotes economic and fiscal coordination. We reached agreement with the Parliament on the so-called two-pack of economic governance legislation. It's the first cousin of the six-pack for those who are tragic. <laughs> uh, the two-pack, uh, government that was designed to improve budgetary and economic coordination in the, within the euro area. We also reached agreement with the Parliament on the Capital Requirements Directive. This is very important. Um, it would ensure that European banks hold enough good quality capital to withstand future economic shocks. It should also enforce greater transparency. It should also discourage excessive risk taking, including restrictions uh, through restrictions on bankers' pay. Restrictions on bankers' pay are always a good thing. We reached agreement also on a general approach in the whole area of banking resolution and recovery, which has now been taken on by the current presidency. Um, and a very interesting discussion it is too. But that was not all. The, stabi the stability agenda involves work across a whole range of complex uh, and important dossiers, which tend not to get much notice uh, in the media generally. Um, but you're recovering areas like mortgage credit, transparency directives, savings tax, uh, and so on. I've given, I've given a list down on one side as well of the levels of agreement because of the complexity of this. Very often it's very hard to say something is done and dusted and there it is. But you rather move it to the next point of the process. So in certain cases we reach an approach, in other cases we have first, the first reading agreement. Much depends on the particular legal basis on which the process is done, which the proposal is put out there. On the budget, the multi multi-annual financial framework, the other major plank of the stability agenda, agreement was reached with Council, within Council on the 8th of February. And then, just prior to the European Council on 27th of June, the agreement was reached with the, with the European Parliament. Um, much of the time and effort of the presidency, uh, as I said earlier, political capital, was invested in the multi-annual financial framework. The negotiations were long, they were difficult, and they were sensitive. It is, after all, the basis for delivering on economic recovery, also on jobs, growth, and social cohesion. The result which we have arrived at Clears the way now for the release of almost one trillion euros as soon as possible into the real economy. And these are the policies which will contribute to sustainable jobs and growth. We believe, too, that the budget is focused on the right issues, tackling youth unemployment, boosting key growth areas such as research and innovation, and importantly, uh, in a very European way, maintaining solidarity with less developed states and with regions which have been particularly affected by the crisis. It's important to understand the reach of the multi-annual financial framework. It affects all key policies. Um, a good sense of this can be gleaned when the constituent elements are broken down. In concrete terms, um, there, it means uh, the result means that the union has available to it uh, funds 
to cover the key policies across youth unemployment, the common agricultural policy, research and innovation, connecting Europe, Erasmus Plus, small and medium sided press, and so on and so forth. On jobs, the framework agreement includes 6 billion euros for a new youth unemployment initiative called Youth Guarantee. This is about tackling unemployment where it really hurts, but it's also about promoting training and education. The guarantee is quite concrete in its output. It aims to ensure that young people who are not working or studying receive an offer of employment, continuing education, apprenticeship, or training. Why is it important? Well, it has the potential, ladies and gentlemen, we believe, to increase empl the employment rate, to reduce early school leaving, and to help lift many young people out of poverty and exclusion. But we also took important related decisions on the whole area of cross-border mobility, on an expanded uh, Erasmus Plus program, on a recognition of professional qualifications, posting workers, portability, pension rights, and so on. And these are the kind of nuts and bolts measures which open up opportunities and which make a difference. On the single market, in terms of investing in sustainable jobs and growth, there was a particular focus, as I said at the outset, placed on the digital center, center the digital single market. Hence, we find ourselves working in a whole series of areas, data protection, cyber security, web accessibility, high-speed broadband rollout, uh, and so on. In terms of what we now call smart growth, as well, order in promoting uh, research innovation. Again, the most significant achievement, which is directly linked back to the framework, is Horizon 2020. It sets the agenda for research and innovation for the next seven years and releases 70 billion euros for the purpose. Um, we hear much today about small and medium sized businesses, the potential they offer for injecting growth into the economy. We have sought to unlock much of that potential too. Uh, we've reached agreement with the Parliament of Company Law Directives, the Union Customs Code, competitiveness arrangements, and so on. Um, in parallel with the strengthening of the single market, work has also advanced on the external trade agenda. Ireland has an open, trade-focused economy with an historically close relationship with the US, set itself the target of agreeing a formal mandate for the Commission to start negotiations on a new EU-US free trade agreement perhaps again, in case of a time of presidency. But it was with particular satisfaction uh, that we presided over that agreement um, of an negotiated mandate. And we believe that this is a potential game changer with the capacity to turn enormous potential for jobs and growth into reality. We also advanced negotiations with Japan, Thailand, Singapore, India, China, and ASEAN uh, in the world trade. Um, I mentioned briefly the whole question of foreign policy that is of particular interest to the Institute. But working closely with the High Representative um, and with the WAS, the Presidency focuses on tensions on a range of issues, including EU enlargement, neighborhood policy, protection of human rights, and indeed development policy. If I could just say a word on enlargement. Um, when Ireland was last in the Presidency in 2004, it oversaw the accession of 10 new member states. The current 27 became 28 on 1 July this year with the accession of Croatia. On this occasion also, we advanced the processes with Turkey and with Montenegro. And we're particularly pleased that agreement was reached at the European Council, or confirmed at the European Council, on opening enlargement negotiations uh, with Serbia uh, and on opening the stability and association agreement uh, with Kosovo. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, when we published our presidency program back in January, we said then that the 2013 Irish presidency would be about real and tangible decisions about securing stability and about encouraging jobs and growth. Um, many of you will know the potential and the limits of what a presidency can achieve in six months. It cannot transform the union. It doesn't hold all the cards. It's a complex leadership role. It involves partnerships with member states, the commission, the president of the European Council, the parliament of the institutions for a member state, effectively, is a rendezvous. It's a rendezvous at a point in time. When the member, st member state shows up, the agenda is largely set. That said, the presidency sets the tone for the discussions, and it can exert considerable influence in the emphasis that is placed on particular themes or specific aspects of the work of the union. But through creative 
and dynamic leadership, it can also move the agenda forward. The converse, of course, also was, was true. So one would be wrong to claim credit for everything good that has happened under its watch over the last six months. Uh, equally, uh, its role is sufficiently important and central to the work of the Union, and it should at least be acknowledged. But whatever the assessment of the presidency of the member state which holds it, or which held it for the first six months of this year, frankly, that assessment can wait for another day. The fact remains that during that period, a number of significant decisions have been taken. We got some results. In fairness, some fairly important results. The multi-annual financial framework is a big one. The importance of putting in place a deal on the union's budget, which will provide a solid basis for economic growth, a legal framework which underpins a budget of almost a trillion euros and sets its course, sets our course up to 2020, cannot be underestimated. The progress towards banking union is a big one too. The global financial and economic crisis and the ongoing fiscal crisis exposed the shortcomings in the economic governance of the, uh, of the Eurozone. We believe now that we are witnessing the restoration of confidence around public finances in the member states and in the European banking sector. We were determined that our presidency should leave a positive and a lasting legacy for the EU and for Ireland. And our approach, essentially, was to identify concrete proposals in those areas where progress would make a real difference. So with one eye to where we started, we dare to think at this stage that the interrelated causes of jobs, stability and growth have indeed been progressed. And that perhaps, perhaps, the cause of Europe is a little better. Ireland's passage in its rotational presidency. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, I suppose it's worth recalling that something may seem self-evident, but nonetheless, Ireland, for its part, does not take Europe or European unity, for that matter, for granted. We work at it. Europe has been good for Ireland, and we like to think that in its own small way, Ireland, through consistent and constructive engagement, has been good for Europe too. Well, that was that was very enlightening. On one aspect, though, Noel, uh, my my curiosity is piqued, and that is, yes, you had a very constructive role to play, seven times president of the European Union. I guess my question really relates to Ireland itself. Tell us, in, 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 if you would, how Ireland is, is traveling economically. I mean, uh, there's been this enormous catharsis. Ireland was doing so well in the 90s up into the, up into the crunch, and then it's, it's suffered like everyone else. Is it, is it, uh, is it benefiting, is it de developing its own economic growth now? Is there, is there a, an impetus that could be developed. Is it, you, you seem to say it's only through the, the EC, but I'd like to know more about the nation state of Ireland within that union and how you're going, how you're traveling. Um, this is, as, uh, we like to call it a bit of a curate's egg. You know? Yes, it's, it's good It's good in parts. Yeah. Um, the reality is that the economic indicators at this stage, I know that sounds terribly dry, but the economic indicators, because that's all we have to go on, are very good. Exports are booming, foreign direct investment, uh, levels of foreign direct investment back, in the world are back at the levels that they were pre crisis. Uh, debt levels are, are high but stabilizing. The nation's finances are under control. We like to think as well uh, that our reputation has been restored since the trauma of the crisis. Mm -hmm. As against that, and this is the curate's egg aspect of it, unemployment is at, an, is at an unacceptably high level, hovering around 14%. 14%. 14%. Youth and uh, youth employment is what, early 20s, 20, it's somewhere around, around, around there. Um, unacceptable. Yeah. And, and those of you, those of you who have, who have uh, an eye or need an ear for these things, we hear many Irish voices in Sydney and Melbourne, Tasmania uh, and elsewhere. Um, and somehow there is a cause and effect relationship going on here. Um, Australia is, is, uh, is travelling in a different place at a different time in a different way. Uh, but curiously, we find that the uh, skilled Irish population, uh, when particularly the Irish construction industry affected from the top of the cliff, um, many of those people now find themselves gainfully employed, 
abroad in Australia, in the UK, uh, in the US. Um, this has been a feature of, 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 of Irish economic development over the years. It's not something that we encourage. Um, but Irish people typically have emigrated in times of economic, of, of economic crisis. I mean, that, that is woven into our history. Um, but what we are about uh, in terms of the Irish network abroad, Irish embassies abroad, and the Irish state agencies abroad, Enterprise Ireland, the Industrial Development Authority, Tourism Ireland, so that indeed, is about creating <coughs> the business and trade opportunities, so bringing about the business and trade opportunities which create jobs back in Ireland mm -hmm. and reinvigorate the economy in, 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 in that way. And to use a slightly overworked phrase, at that point, creating circumstances which integration becomes a matter of, of choice rather than one of necessity. Good. Questions? Yes. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Um, thank you, Ambassador. <coughs> um, the European Union is a, a very mixed hybrid of nations. Yeah. Perhaps stand up yes. so everyone yeah. can hear. The European Union is a very mixed hybrid of nations at the moment with a, a wide variety of economies. And um, I'm given the problems in Greece, in Portugal, in Ireland, mm -hmm. In Ireland, I was just curious as to uh, whether or not the European Union actually needed the euro and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. It does. <laughs> um, is the is a simple answer to the question. I I don't think if 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 you look at the progress of uh, economic and monetary union, the process from Maastricht through to today, where it started out at Maastricht, through to today. Um, I think first of all it's important to remember that Economic and Monetary Union, EMU, uh, does not exist in a bubble, no more than political union exists in a the bubble. These, these, these things are all interrelated. They are part of the evolution, the progression that is Europe, which starts from uh, the uh, aftermath of the Second World War. Uh, and you move on from there. Um, I think no one, no one is denying at this point that the architecture around the euro was deficient. Um, but then there weren't too many people uh, predicting the kind of crisis uh, that Europe and indeed the world uh, was, going to, was going to be hit with. In our case, we were particularly exposed as a small trading, open trading, uh, trading economy. Um, it's an interesting point you make. I don't detect anywhere in the conversation around the architecture, around banking union, around banking resolution, um, any of these issues to a sense that uh, the problem is the euro per se, uh, but rather that the architecture, the design around it needs to be adapted to the kind of challenges that it, that it has to go on. Sure, we have common communication, which I think it, it's, 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 it's an attractive argument to say, let's all just go back to our national currencies and see whatever. The world has moved on in that case. Um, our economies are interlinked. We, we function in the European Union, we function as a single market. Uh, the, we, 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 we adhere to the, the concept of the free movement of, uh, of goods, of people. Um, and th these, are, these are important tenets, and the euro is fundamentally part of that. Um, it is interesting to note, I think, as well, that the, uh, the markets for the moment, see, are, are, are taking a more positive view uh, of where the, where the euro is going. Can I add a supplementary? Does that, does that uh, then assume um, a more central role for a European bank and um, a central control of budgets of the member nations of the European Union? I, it would be, it would be, it would be rash uh, and, and, and inappropriate uh, to, for me to say what, 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 what the final destination is in the particular discussion. But there are pillars of banking union which have been set out uh, by the Commission, by the President of the European Council, and they work towards the kind of areas that you're talking about. <coughs> if you take a situation where you have a uh, single supervisory, we have si supervisory mechanisms across the world <coughs> which clearly are not functioning in a coherent way, and when a crisis hits, that that deficiency is shown up, then it, it's not long before we put our heads together to work out a single supervisory mechanism, uh, and in this case, which would effectively be run by the ECB, become part of the ECB functions, it's something that is needed. That is where we're heading towards. The two-pack, the European semester, 
is talking also is moving in the direction of what we call greater policy coordination around the budget area, which is fair enough. That's not that's not to say that something everything is subsumed and drawn into the vortex in Brussels. The member, the member, the member states are here to stay. We just find a different way of accommodating that pooling of sovereignty. But it, it is it is it is a, it is a, it's a progressive uh, process which is developed which is developed. Is dynamic. Mm -hmm. Yes, gentlemen at the back. I'm not sure this mic is working, but just yeah, hold sure it. It's not. I've got two, and I don't think either of them will work. Well, psychologically, it's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> but speak up, sir. I'm yeah. sure we'll be able to hear your voice. Yes. Uh, no, thanks for all the great insights. Uh, you spoke in your speech about enlargement, and um, there is this perception that the recent economic unpleasantness has sort of refocused the EU's, yeah, nice. EU's attention inwards mm. and sort of created this four or five year gap you know, in terms of where the EU was looking inwards rather than outwards again. I just wanted to get your thoughts on enlargement in the sense of countries that you did not speak about, so I'm thinking of Moldova, Ukraine, mm. Georgia, all these aspiring nations, and maybe to a lesser extent Belarus and even Russia. Do you, is there, because of this gap, or because of any other reason, do you think these states have sort of been resigned to an irretrievable status for the EU? I think, I think first of all, it's an undeniable reality, and, and more, more, more worth of recalling, um, that uh, despite all its apparent shortcomings, um, countries around Europe and in the European area uh, are knocking on the door constantly to get in uh, to this European Union. Um, it, it may seem self-evident and obvious, but very often self-evident and obvious are worth, uh, are worth restating. Um, I think there is, we shouldn't underestimate uh, the psychological importance of the accession of Croatia. Um, and alongside that, uh, the arrangements, the accommodation that has been reached in terms of opening negotiations. Uh, with I've worked in the mid-90s, I worked in particular aspects uh, of uh, on the political side of Brussels, political, political particular aspects of the uh, of the war in Bosnia, and uh, it's it's useful to stand back, you know, to take your head out of the engine occasionally and look back at the entire vehicle. Um, and this was one of those moments for me. As we, went, as we went on to another reception to note the accession of Croatia. This, for me, and for many of my, my, my contemporaries and colleagues, there was not just you know, another another reception. This was an important moment in time. Um, you're seeing as well once you broaden that net, once you widen that net, to use the euro term as opposed to deepening to widen the net, you're seeing continuing conversations and negotiations going on, um, relationships being developed uh, on a broader uh, uh, broader plateau uh, the whole time, including with many of the that, that you have mentioned. So it is a dynamic process. Uh, much as I said that the single market is one of the most successful, one of the great success stories, uh, it might seem dry and dull to say that, um, but the single market is a great success story. Enlargement also is the great success story uh, of the European Union and continues to be. And in terms of political leverage, uh, that uh, particularly I say this to, to those who criticize the European Union as being an economic uh, uh, um, powerhouse and a, a foreign policy mouse, um, at least my metaphors there are some. I mean, the only you know what I mean, on nerves. Um, that, that it that it is you know punching below its weight. There you are. It's all the medical <laughs> um, But that it hasn't got that foreign policy weight. I would say that we look at look at enlargement and the leverage, the process that has gone on through from war uh, in 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 former Yugoslavia through to a situation where those countries are now exceeding, uh, are either exceeding or have or have a perspective of exceeding. To uh, the European Union remains open, as you know the basic policy is, it remains open uh, to those, those countries which adhere to basic principles of democracy. Uh, and that remains, remains the case. <coughs> One of the things you said, uh, Noel, when you were talking to our interns was that when the crisis struck, I think in 2008, you, know, you brought back, your foreign ministry brought back all heads of mission, all Irish heads of mission, we're at a major conference about the direction Ireland was going to take. 
It strikes me as an Australian, former Australian diplomat, that that's a very um, adventurous and good thing to do. I don't think we've ever done that. But at least to my question, which is, you talked about trade with Asia. Um, Australia, unfortunately, has one of the, <coughs> the lowest number of diplomatic posts overseas of any comparable OECD country. Uh, how many posts do you have in Asia, and do you see expansion of these posts? On the specific question of Asia, we have at the moment, well, I mean, uh, so Katrina is counting from the seven, eight, George? Seven. 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 So nine, Tokyo, eight, Seoul, nine, Tokyo, nine, Seoul, nine, Tokyo, Seoul, Tokyo, Seoul, Beijing, Singapore, Singapore, Singapore Shanghai, Thailand. Thailand. No, not Thailand. Not Thailand? No. Oh, the Thais have a tremendous amount. Culturally, the Irish. I'm sure we built Thailand. I think we built Australia and the United States. I'm sure we did. I'm sure we did. Especially the Irish. I was. It was, it, it, was like, it was actually what I was referring to was, was in 2011. The 2008 the crisis hit. 2000, 2010, we entered a, a, a program, as you've missed it, you refer to it as a program of support uh, through the ECB, IMF, and the EU. Um, and in 2011, we had a general election, uh, and a new government was brought, was brought, brought into power. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, and of course, I was saying as well, of course, it, it warms the heart of every diplomat to know that, that they have a role to play in all of this. They, it, they, it was, it was, uh, it was very reassuring. Um, but there was a key issue for us at that point, which is the whole question of reputation. Um, there was a lot written in, in the media at the time about how Ireland fought from great heights. Um, uh, which we felt needed to be redressed. Mm -hmm. Certainly our response to the crisis, the uh, uh, policy response mm -hmm. that we worked out with our international partners and, <coughs> and the course that we set for ourselves in terms of getting out of that crisis was something that needed to be explained. Mm -hmm. um, and in a, in a curious and again a really short way, old-fashioned diplomacy came back, came back into fashion. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, this is what we have been doing uh, alongside uh, the whole question of promoting trade and uh, promoting trade and business <coughs> right across the world, including here uh, in Australia. I constantly point out to Australian audiences that whilst the story of the relationship, the historical relationship in Australia, clearly immigration is a hugely important element of that, and the current wave of immigration is an important element in that. But there is this other side of the coin, which is that business and trade relationship as well, which complements the cultural and historical links that have existed between these two countries for many, many years. Uh, and I think it's important that we, that we get, get that out there. In the whole high-tech sector, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Australia is now the third most important market export market really? for Irish high-tech goods. Yeah. These are healthcare and financial services. Mm -hmm. The sort of widgets that run our lives, but we don't quite know what they are, but they are running our lives. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but equally, in the construction, engineering, and mining sector, we're finding, again, that we have space in that market, whether it's in WA, Queensland, or Queensland, and elsewhere. Your export market interest. Interesting. Bob. Yeah. Can I just draw your attention? Oh, Bob Howard, I'm on the council. Can I draw your attention to uh, a more general EU issue? The um, prospect of a US EU free trade agreement has been rightly, I think, described by some <coughs> commentators as a real geopolitical game changer, and I agree with that, if I could believe that it was at all feasible. There seem to be so many differences between these two entities, uh, so many differences that lead me to believe that it's just not on. I'm just wondering whether, from your point of view, you think it is on or not. You're completely wrong about it's on. <laughs> um, no, look, I'm, I'm being facetious. It, it, is, it is the game changer. It's figures of 0.5% GDP have been mentioned as a kind of flow back into the economy and then that you translate that back into jobs and suddenly we start to game changer. I think psychologically for start, it's a huge uh, boost uh, to uh, the union as a trading, as a, as a, as a trading entity. Uh, it's long overdue. You're absolutely right when you say that there are all of these challenges. Uh, but equally, uh, those of us, and I wasn't directly involved, but those of us who were watching this quite closely and would have had some, some awareness of this from, pre, from previous lives, 
you know, so that the kind of challenges that we needed to overcome with media and media itself to write a ghost were almost insurmountable. Um, but yet we did. Yet we did. We did it in the Union of 27, which is, which is not bad. Um, I think if you can harness that sort of engagement, you can overcome, if the political will is there to overcome those sort of differences, um, that you arrive at the negotiating mandate. Remember, this is now, it's, it's commission competence at this point in negotiating. On the basis of the mandate in the United States, uh, I think there is every reason to be confident uh, that it will result in a uh, in a real and meaningful uh, EU US uh, trade agreement. Of course, it raises very interesting questions about other parts of the world that we should be in focus as well uh, in terms of those kind of trade agreements. It raises very interesting questions about Doha and about the whole trading uh, mechanisms. But that's for another day. My fundamental point is, yes, you're right. It's a big one. It's a big challenge. But so also with the point about getting to a post Any Further questions? I think, yes, question from this lady. Heather Johnson, member. Having just returned from the UK, I was there for about three weeks, uh, I was struck by the anti-EU feeling that is quite right at the moment. And I think that Cameron has promised that if he wins a further term, there will be a referendum about whether the UK should remain in the EU. I'd just be interested in your comments on that negative side of all this. I, I, I wouldn't make any comment at all about any other member state um, and, 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 and how they deal with the internal narrative and internal discussion about the um, not only because I couldn't really add very much to it, but frankly, it would be um, I think, having said that, um, we each approach this, member states approach this in different, in different ways. I mentioned in my, in, in, in my address uh, that in our case we've had several, a series of referenda. Uh, we argue endlessly, we argue endlessly about everything. Um, but ultimately, but that is part of the process of, arri of, of arriving at, uh, at a common position. Um, so we each approach these things differently. The member states approach these things differently, and different. informed by a whole series of factors, political, historical, cultural, uh, and so on. Now, I would say one thing, one thing about, not directly about the point you raised, but that in terms of where we see uh, our future in the European Union, that European Union includes a very active and central role in the UK, uh, as are still our nearest uh, and most important trade. Um, and that is that is something that uh, certainly, to the extent that we have a role in this, our, our energies would be, would be directed towards ensuring that that, 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 that remains a permanent reality. The internal politics of the UK are not Thank you. I think we've just about um, satiated everyone's curiosity now, and I think you've given an, an extremely comprehensive uh, account of what's going on right now. Your presidency. When is it? It's finished. Oh, it's, 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 I, was, I was meant to be. I was meant to be here about three months ago. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but but I, I'm cool about it. I've, I've moved on. <laughs> yeah. I've moved on. I've moved on from that. It's all the board wax. We finished. We, we, fin I'm only we finished in. Uh, we finished at the end of uh, at the end of June. Yeah. Uh, we handed over to to Lithuania, uh, which again is an interesting thing. Uh, whoever whoever thought ten. 10, 11 years ago, which is not an awful long time ago, I would be saying that we hand it over to the President of the Party of Estonia and that day. I think it's interesting to remark as well, just one last point on that. Um, I don't think we should underestimate in all of this in terms of where the EU is going. And sure, there are bumps along the way. And I remember when we started, when I got involved in this first, it was all about Eurosclerosis. And uh, Eurosclerosis was going to be the end of us all. Yes. Um, and then we had the single market, and we had the law, and so on. And those processes, yeah. Have moved on. There is one one feature of the end of the presidency, and the European Council, the European Council conclusions which have been our last major meeting of the presidency, just captured. <coughs> one is the uh, agreement on uh, on, a, on on going forward with stability and association with Kosovo. The other was on Serbia, which I mentioned. And the other is uh, interestingly on Latvia uh, and its accession to the Europe uh, on the first of January. Um, so again, 
in the context of a union which doubtless has many, many faults, that many, many people still not in the majority to get in, in the context of the euro, which has many, many faults, there are still, it's reassuring to know that there are others out there who are still not going to get in and say that there's some value in doing that. Well, let's hope it maintains the cohesion. I'd like to invite one of our new interns, Rosie Blaros, to come and propose a vote of thanks to you. And that's done. Thank you. Hi everyone. On behalf of the Institute, I'd like to thank you, Ambassador White, for your insights on the Irish presidency of the EU. Needless to say, Ireland assumed the presidency at a critical juncture with Ireland being one of the hardest hit member states by the Eurozone crisis. With a focus on job stability and growth, I have no doubt that the Irish presidency's legacy will be one of growth and restoring Ireland's credibility worldwide. It is therefore extremely reassuring to see that the majority of the Irish people believe that Ireland benefits from their EU membership. And I'm sure that Ireland's strong leadership of the EU these past six months will yield a resounding legacy for the European recovery. So once again, thank you, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just before we conclude,